This is CNN 10 and I'm Carl Azus. On the heels of yesterday's report about a tropical storm off the U.S. East Coast, we have a bigger, more dangerous storm to tell you about today. This one's in the Bay of Bengal in the northern Indian Ocean and it could cause catastrophic problems for northeastern India and the nation of Bangladesh. Its name is Cyclone Ampan. It's been hovering at or near the strongest classification of hurricane strength. The good news is it's expected to lose some of that strength as it approaches land, so that could make it less destructive than it is now. The bad news is Ampan is expected to make landfall in a part of the world that is not well equipped to deal with it. The storm is headed toward poor areas with a lot of people and not a lot of good infrastructure, like transportation and communications networks. It's expected to make landfall near the Ganges River Delta, where the Ganges and the Brahmaputra Rivers empty into the Bay of Bengal, and that could bring major storm surges, a rise in seawater levels blown ashore by a cyclone. Natural disasters are common in this part of the world, but this could be the first time a powerful storm hits India and Bangladesh during a disease pandemic. Both countries are seeing increasing cases and deaths from COVID-19, despite extending their lockdowns until the end of this month. So first responders could be called on to both rescue people and help protect them from coronavirus, which will be a concern, especially in crowded evacuation centers. Meteorologist Pedram Javahiri for CNN Weather and a menacing tropical cyclone Ampan, now equivalent to a Category 5 hurricane if it were into the Atlantic Ocean. But of course, Bay of Bengal, very vulnerable region, 260 kilometer per hour sustained winds, gusting to 315 kilometers per hour, and certainly a very slow moving system. And notice this track, West Bengal, Bangladesh, we're talking to you, especially Wednesday into Thursday. This storm system is poised to weaken on approach towards land, but even if it does, such a tremendously large system and such a strong system that we do know the impacts at even a Category 2 or a Category 3 equivalent could be significant. Now, look at the population of Bangladesh, 170 million people, compare that to the United States, about 328 million people, except Bangladesh, roughly the size of an average U.S. state, like the state of Iowa, but again, with half the population of the U.S., packed into that region. So that really makes it that much more susceptible here to causing a lot of damage, a lot of lives lost potentially. And of course, notice some 700 rivers and tributaries across this region, some 24,000 kilometers of waterways. Landfall at this point looks to be somewhere on the coast there near Kolkata. That would begin Wednesday afternoon or Wednesday evening, but certainly a story will follow here on CNN over the next several days. Another way Spain is easing those measures, its government is allowing professional sports teams to get back to practice even if they're in a region that's still shut down. They have to train in groups of 10 people or fewer though. There are signs of this opening back up in the U.S. as well. Live golf returned to American televisions on Sunday when a charity event took place. Another is planned for next Sunday, though you won't see any spectators yet. President Donald Trump says sports are good for the nation's psyche, that they're missed, wanted, and needed. And that's something being echoed at the youth levels too. But when they get going again across the country, and this won't happen all at once, they'll likely look a lot different than they did before the coronavirus pandemic struck. Summer and kids playing baseball. They go together. That was until the pandemic shut down nearly all youth sports. But in Missouri, it was game on. But there were changes. It's weird. 
Yeah, it definitely doesn't feel normal. Take the baseballs, wipe down with bleach water every half inning. And the dugouts, spray down after each game. And teammates had to stand six feet apart. These yellow flags, that marks their spots. Parents and fans, they have to social distance as well. And expect to see similar precautions in different youth sports. Here's how USA Swimming is telling its 2,800 teams to set up for meets and still maintain social distancing. High fives, fist bumps, and post-game handshakes, all a thing of the past. That's according to Skip Gilbert. He's the CEO for U.S. Youth Soccer, which has almost 3 million registered players. The social distancing is key. He says most of their seasons will start back up in June, so he's ordered coaches and organizers to create new COVID-oriented safety checklists. When you get home, you're cleaning your boots, you wash your hands, you're washing your uniform. You're doing all of the things just to ensure that if there was any contaminant that got onto anything that you had brought to that field to play, that you're making sure that you remove it. Even with all that, plenty of parents are telling us they're not letting their kids play team sports right now. But then there are those like Jill DeLeon. Her 12-year-old son, Peyton, he's supposed to attend a pricey soccer academy this summer. Why are you so comfortable letting Peyton play? I think we're okay. Um, we're doing our, you know, washing our hands and keeping our hands away from our face. Maybe if, if we, even if we came into contact with someone and we had to quarantine ourselves for 14 days, that's something we could do. 10 second trivia. Salt marsh, atlas, and Indian meal are all types of what? Vultures, moths, herbs, or peat? These are all types of moths, insects that often fly by night. Those are just three of the 160,000 species of moths, and new research suggests they may play an important role in pollination. How do scientists know this? A few years ago in Norfolk, England, researchers swabbed more than 800 moths and then studied the pollen on them. It wasn't a direct study of pollination, the process that fertilizes plants and produces seeds, but instead a look at how pollen is transported. That's an important early part of the pollination process. Scientists found that more than 45% of the moths they studied had visited dozens of different plant species during the night, including some that bees and butterflies didn't visit during the day. And researchers say this adds to the importance of conserving the insects because like bee populations, moth populations are decreasing worldwide. Scientists say to address that, people should reduce the use of pesticides when possible and make sure that moths have a food source and an undisturbed place to live. Their research was published in the journal Biology Letters. Last story today is about a dog named Moose, who despite a possible identity crisis, has just received an honorary doctorate during a virtual commencement ceremony at Virginia Tech. Moose has been working there as a therapy animal since 2014. He's one of four dogs that have participated in more than 7,500 counseling sessions with students. His owner also works at Virginia Tech as a counselor, but it's Moose who just got his degree in veterinary medicine. Of course, he'd never tell the undergrads to Moose over. The Labradoctor who just got his dog Pluma is an excellent counselor who's on paw to help students turn tail on whatever's dogging them to retrieve her a sense of bona fide well barking. I'm Carla Moose, I mean Zeus for CNN 10. That dog might have been a Labrador, but it's the Huskies we've got today watching from Elgin High School in Elgin, Oregon. We'll see y'all tomorrow.